In case you missed it, Microsoft acquired Activision Blizzard King last October for nearly $69 billion, one of many massive acquisitions Microsoft has made in the space in the last few years as they work to ramp up their exclusives and their access to major studios. The acquisition itself was a massively controversial one in terms of regulatory hurdles, with Microsoft spending the better part of two years fighting regulators to be allowed to go through with it. At the time, I saw a ton of people supporting Microsoft in this and getting mad at regulators for holding up what they saw as a company that would help usher their favorite games into a new era once they were in charge, or more specifically, once Bobby Kotick was no longer in charge. Personally, I was skeptical. I mean, obviously anything that removes an abusive monster like Kodak from a position of power isn't all bad, but I've seen what Microsoft has done in the past. Whether it's the obvious examples like Rare, one of the most influential studios that published some of the most iconic, medium-defining games of all time that basically entirely fell off post-Microsoft acquisition, or whether it's the small-scale examples like the one I talked about in my Quantum Redshift video, this didn't spell good things for ABK. Whenever I mentioned that I thought this was long-term going to go badly, I'd get pushback from Overwatch fans, so I decided to just hold my tongue until people started to see those negative consequences. Regrettably, I didn't have to wait long. At the end of January, just three months after the acquisition was finalized, Microsoft laid off 1,900 people across their gaming division, predominantly from ABK. This represented about 8% of the entire Microsoft gaming division and about 15% of the pre-merger workforce of Activision, Blizzard, and King. If you've been keeping up with gaming industry news throughout 2023, you know that this is very much so part of an ongoing trend. The gaming industry saw around 16,000 layoffs in the last 13 to 14 months, despite this being one of the biggest and best years in gaming in recent years, both in terms of some of the games that came out and in terms of the profits. Hey, so, editing Viv here. When I initially wrote this video at the end of January, these were most of the numbers that we had. I recorded the audio for it at the beginning of this week, which would have been, what, Monday, February 26th, I think? Uh, since then, there have been about another 1,500 or so layoffs. There were 900 at Sony and 670, I believe, at EA. I just wanted to kind of add this little note in here because this video was operating off the assumption that there weren't those 1,500 layoffs. That's the scale of the problem. Anyways, back to the actual video. Something I want to talk about is what kind of impact this approach is going to have on the games we play in the short, medium, and long term. A lot of very talented people lost their jobs because of a bullshit acquisition that any reasonable anti-competitive laws would have blocked, but unfortunately we're in late stage neoliberal capitalism and we don't do protections for workers or consumers so that's not happening. However, thanks to decades of the aforementioned neoliberal capitalist brain rot, I've seen a lot of people who seem to think that that isn't important, that the only relevant outcome is the one that this will have on the games they want to buy, and damn the people who make them or how badly that company can screw them at checkout. So, for those people, I want to talk about why this is going to negatively impact the games you play. Your favorite games are going to get worse because of these decisions, and even if you don't care about your fellow workers or even yourself as a consumer, you should still be wary of what's happening in the industry right now. Also, be sure to stick around to the end of the video where we're going to talk about the next member's choice poll that started today and the study I'm conducting, which also started today. However, that's for later. For now, we gotta get into the actual video. Part 1. The Short Term in the short term, you're going to see very little immediate change as a consumer. Gaming is a slow-to-react industry because it is a hugely complicated one involving massive teams working interdependently on complex projects, so by the time anything reaches the consumer, it's usually already years and years in the making. This applies to, you know, finished big projects like games, but also relatively simple things like cosmetics for Overwatch, where the pipeline from start to finish can take over a year, and things like new heroes or new maps can take multiple years. The short-term impacts for you will be understated in terms of the danger coming down the road, like water levels falling on the beach before a tsunami runs through it. You might look at executives talking about how well the company is performing, you might see balance sheets or reports about profits and think, hey, the company's still doing pretty good without all those people. Or you might see a trailer for a new season of content and think, huh, they're still putting out the same amount of product without all those extra people, and come to the conclusion that the people who were cut were just fluff. The Microsoft went through with a fine-tooth comb and cleaned out all the useless or inefficient team members so the company could emerge more efficient and effective. You are thinking about this wrong because Microsoft is thinking about this wrong. I mean, sure, some of those positions probably were made superfluous by the acquisition because the jobs were duplicated to some extent or just didn't fit the company's organizational structure, but most of them were Microsoft trying to make this acquisition look good on a balance sheet. 1,900 people is millions and millions of dollars in labor over the years that Microsoft just saved that it otherwise would have been on the hook for, not to mention benefits it would have owed over time. Microsoft spent billions of dollars on this company, and it's going to need to prove to investors that it was a smart choice. The easiest way to increase your profits is to cut your expenses. Which expenses are the most vulnerable? Well, it's not going to be executive pay, and it's not going to be executive golden parachutes, because the executives are the ones making the choice here. If workplaces were even marginally democratic, where there were reasonable, effective worker protections, things would be different. But again, that's not happening. They're not going to cut their stock buybacks, they're not going to cut their benefits and bonuses that they get for being at the very top of the company. Instead, they're going to cut workers. And a lot of them. However, this video is for the people who don't really care about those people. So, let's talk about the impacts on you, as a consumer of this content. Many of the impacts of these kinds of layoffs will not be felt short term. When Blizzard's layoffs went through, one of the immediate consequences was that a survival game that Blizzard has been developing for a few years, presumably going to be their first new IP since Overwatch, was killed. Years of work are just gone now. 
And this is also regrettably a trend in modern media production across the board, with companies just scrapping creative work for tax breaks, for profitability reasons, whatever. Most noticeably in Hollywood with the likes of Warner Brothers getting American taxpayers to pay them millions of dollars for movies to not be released. However, even in that instance, that's still not really an impact that we the consumers are feeling today. It's the loss of something months, years in advance from when we otherwise would have gotten it, but we didn't know anything about it. Hell, most people didn't even know that that game existed, that survival IP that they were coming out with, until they learned that it got canned. Other short-term impacts are going to seem pretty minimal from the outside. Mainly, it's just going to look like a lot of very sad people, both those who've been fired and those who remain with Survivor's Guild. The things that appear in the in-game shop will still be there, because like I said, a lot of those things have been in the works for months or even years before they're up for sale. Don't get me wrong here, it'll still take a whole bunch of crunch from the remaining workforce to get that shit out on time for the deadline for the next few seasons, but they're able to pick up the torch and run it to the finish line for now. Stuff like trailers for upcoming seasons and new content updates will similarly largely be in either the finishing touches stage or the it's already done and we're just waiting for it to go live stage. Companies like to build in buffer room for stuff like this. They don't want to be approving a skin or a competitive update the day it goes live, so stuff gets done in advance. The rollout can be smooth, planned, and prepared. Now, this shit is not unique to Microsoft, to the gaming industry, or even to the private sector. Governments do this shit too. In my home province of Alberta, progressive conservative premier Ralph Klein famously quote-unquote balanced the budget, and I promise I'm using the heaviest air quotes possible here, off the back of massive layoffs and cuts in the healthcare and education sectors, both of which are public sector in Alberta. We lost a lot of nurses and teachers, and when the cuts initially happened, it was similar to what happened here. There were some people whose education or healthcare was immediately affected, such as students with disabilities who required EAs, or people whose surgeries got pushed back due to a lack of staff. A lot of teachers and nurses lost their jobs, and a lot more began looking for other provinces to work in out of fear that they would be next. However, for the average person, the cuts didn't immediately have an impact. Their kids still went to school, and their family doctor was still around. A lot of surgeries were delayed, but not outright cancelled, and a lot of kids maybe got less attention than they should have, but it was still manageable. However, just like with the gaming industry, a good healthcare system or a good educational system is one with a bit of a buffer. You don't want a healthcare system where you've got to get grandma one out of the bed five minutes after surgery because grandma two is going to need it. And you don't want an educational system where kids are getting the bare minimum amount of attention needed or where teachers are forced to burn the candle at both ends just to meet the demands of overcrowded classrooms. You can do it for a little while, you know, you can manage that for a little while, you can make that work for a little while, but how long can you do that for? Eventually, you run out of buffer. Short term, when an industry is large enough, layoffs aren't going to have the biggest impact immediately because there's still, to some degree, momentum. Or at a bare minimum, a lack of a backlog. Things will slow down, but not in a way that will appear disastrous to the outside just yet. This is the point in time where waiting lists are an annoyance, but not an excessive one. A point in time where backlogs start building up, but haven't already built up. If you're a corporation, your cuts to the labor force make the executive at your company look good because the balance sheet looks more positive, or at least less negative, and profits are up. If you're a conservative government, your cuts to the public sector make the politicians look good because the budget looks balanced and costs are down. However, as anyone who's ever tried to date a VTuber can tell you, just because something might be fine in the short term doesn't mean it's not a decision you'll start to regret in the very near future. Part 2. The Medium Term in the short term, expenses are cut and revenues are mostly stable because gaming is an industry where impacts take time to be felt. In the medium term, think the next few years, you'll start to see it more clearly. Once everything that was close to finish or ready to deploy is out the door, you now have to figure out how you're going to keep up that pace with significantly fewer people. You're either going to have to screw the workers or screw the consumer here. You either force your workers to crunch to maintain the same output with less workers, or you'll have to cut corners and deliver worse products to customers while demanding the same prices. Remember, none of this is actually a free marketplace. No one else is allowed to sell an Overwatch cosmetic or a Fortnite cosmetic or a League of Legends cosmetic. Nobody else can swoop in and offer to provide better quality or lower prices for a Mercy skin, so Blizzard doesn't have any competition here. Odds are, we're going to see both. Workers are going to have to crunch, and consumers are going to get a worse deal. It's also important to note, those cost-cutting layoffs aren't going to translate to savings for the customer. Blizzard is going to be saving millions of dollars a year on those lost workers now, and guess what percentage of those savings will be passed on to you? That's right, it's 0%. Whenever the minimum wage is discussed, you'll hear people talking about how a wage increase will result in prices going up, and that's not entirely wrong, but its implications are misleading. The implication is that these companies can't afford to pay more without charging more, but that also assumes there's no slack in their budgets for a pay increase when the fact of the matter is that the entire concept of profit is slack in the budget. Any profit a company reports is the amount of money it has left over after paying all its workers, all its managers, all its executives, all its advertising bills, utilities, and mortgages and supplies and everything else. That's slack in the chain that could have gone to paying those workers, or could have gone to the consumer by cutting prices and giving them a deal. Instead, neither of those things have happened, and neither of those things will happen. Bobby Kotick got a $15 million golden parachute for fucking up the company and many of its employees, and Phil Spencer, the CEO of Microsoft Gaming, has an estimated take-home pay of $10 million a year. There's clearly money in the budget for this stuff. There's money to pay people, it's just going to the executives. There was money in the budget to keep these people hired and give Overwatch fans a discount, frankly, but instead, neither of those things is going to happen. Execs will get richer off the backs of everyone else's labor, both directly from their employees and indirectly through the labor you had to do to pay for the products that they're profiting from. 
However, for a lot of people, the cosmetics aren't what's going to matter. I mean, they're nice, but they're not why you play the game. You play for the gameplay, and might be wondering what that'll mean for you. Well, if we're being honest, nothing good. There's a term for the Canadian Senate as a chamber for sober second thought, with the idea being that part of the reason why we have a Senate is that they aren't embroiled in partisanship or elections like the House of Commons, and so are able to think more calmly, rationally, and clear-headedly about legislation. And yeah, the Canadian Senate isn't elected, it's a whole thing, we don't have time for that right now. The goal is that they'll be able to notice things that were missed in the Commons, or even just be able to come to a more clear consensus about how to fix legislation than the Commons could because they're not in the same frenzy that the House is. A lot of valuable work in gaming is in the form of this sort of sober second thought. People who are given the time and space to think through the problems they're being presented with in terms of balance, bugs, and future plans. You need people who have a few days here and there to just sit around and think about what might be good going forward, and give them the time to chew it over, think about the broader repercussions of any given decision. A game like Overwatch has an incalculable knock-on effect because of its complexity for any decision made, so this is legitimately a really important task. It might not look like work in the way that executives want to be able to quantify things because there's no immediate product being produced or delivered, but deliberative work is still crucial work. And these cuts kill the ability to do that deliberative work. Everyone is now going to be even more crunched because remember there's no flexibility in the release schedule anymore. Overwatch has self-imposed alternating new maps and new heroes every two months for the indefinite future. And particularly when it comes to new heroes, it can't afford to shift that because that's a major selling point for battle passes. There is no room for sober second thought, and there is no room for thinking through all the possible ramifications of a balance change or new hero. And you might say, yeah, but that's already been the case. Blizzard's been fucking up balance for ages. To which I would respond, yeah, and that was them doing their best with that level of staff. What do you think is going to happen when you put them under more pressure with less time and fewer resources? The medium term is where we'll see outcomes really deteriorating. And again, this happened in Alberta post Klein cuts. The what happens here is often that you'll still need labor done, but now you can't do it in-house. In the case of Microsoft and ABK, it's because they laid people off. In the case of the Alberta government, it was because a major component of the public sector was privatized and sold off, and many workers who were still in the public sector were laid off and forced to seek employment in the private sector. And that's the best case. In the worst case, they just left the province's workforce altogether. In both cases, you end up needing external private contractors, who cost more and provide generally worse outcomes because they're not formally integrated into the existing workflow. They're not up to date on the way the company operates, and chains of communication are just more jumbled. An additional wrinkle in the Alberta situation is that the private sector is profit-oriented, meaning that there's an incentive to cut corners to provide the worst possible service service that still technically meets the criteria of the contract where the public sector is, at least in theory, focused entirely on providing that service instead of a profit for some shareholder. In game development, contractors might be brought in for testing, visual effects, or for design in some way, or to help plan levels or something else. In healthcare, private clinics and labs will be set up instead of publicly owned and operated clinics and labs. In education, services for students with disabilities might be offloaded to a private contractor who will provide those services either through the school or separately. Or those students might need to find a private school that can accommodate them instead of public schools being able to do it. Ralph Klein was elected premier in late 1992 after his predecessor Don Getty resigned and won its first proper election in 1993. He committed to balancing the budget, eliminating $3.5 billion in deficit and $12 billion in debt owed to other entities without ever raising taxes. To do so, he slashed 4,000 jobs outright and cut another 1,800 just through privatizing registry services in the ALCB, or Alberta Liquor Control Board. And yes, Alberta used to have government-owned liquor stores. In fact, Alberta is currently the only province in Canada that doesn't have government-owned liquor stores. And having lived in multiple provinces where the government does own the liquor stores, I can promise you that privatizing this sector just meant grimier stores, shittier deals, and worse service. Anyways, more job cuts followed. Alberta Government Telephone, which I talked about in my previous video about politics and paying, was sold off to form TELUS, now one of the big three telecom companies in Canada that everyone hates. Other crown corporations followed suit, and by 1995, oil prices started to rise and Alberta was able to eliminate its deficit, at the cost of thousands of livelihoods and an unknown future cost. However, Klein remained popular because he'd done what he'd said he would. He cut unnecessary, in air quotes, public spending and was balancing the budget. He won re-election in 1997 and 2001 with massive majorities, and in 2004 he announced that by 2005 the province's debts would be gone. That same year, Little Baby Viveros entered the first grade, and by then we were solidly into the late medium term of those cuts. By that point, class sizes had ballooned, teachers were burning out, and services for students, whether it was special needs assistance, general classroom aids, library services, computers, or anything else you can think of, were clearly not handling it well. Classroom materials in particular were an obvious victim of this, with parents being expected to supply a ton of the basic supplies that a classroom needed to function at the start of the year, bus fees increasing, and older and older materials being used. Like that same year, I was introduced to my first computer class, and we were saving our schoolwork on fucking floppy disks. Like, this was in the 2004-2005 school year, and I'm not saying this to flex, but this was generally in one of the more privileged, solidly middle-class to upper-middle-class parts of a generally pretty wealthy city in terms of average income levels. Like, USB sticks were invented in 1999, but we didn't have computers that could handle that shit for at least a few more years, despite living in a province with the third largest oil reserves on Earth. When it comes to healthcare, we saw waitlists increasing as cuts reduced access to services in a timely manner. 
Healthcare became harder to access, particularly in rural areas where public clinics and hospitals reduced their services or outright closed. And since healthcare in rural areas is never going to be profitable, private services didn't tend to replace them unless it was at a colossal markup, even in elements of healthcare that were more privatized. Infrastructure was also a major casualty in this sector as well, such as the Red Deer Hospital being profoundly unsuited to the demands being placed on it in terms of staff, rooms, and equipment as populations grew. The backlog of surgeries and procedures and consultations continued to slowly accumulate over the years. The delays faced under the initial cuts in the early 90s continued to grow, and for less urgent surgeries, those delays were even worse unless you paid for private care either in the province or abroad. Klein even proposed an outright privatization plan at one point that he called a third way that would have violated Canadian law. Once that plan failed, by the way, he actually threw the opposition Liberal Party's healthcare policy book at a 17-year-old legislature staffer out of anger. This was incidentally not out of character for him. The man had previously gone to a homeless shelter over the Christmas holidays to harass and berate the people he'd helped push into the streets. Ralph Klein was a shitty person with a complete lack of empathy for his fellow humans, and his policies reflected it. Albertans who needed urgent care could, depending on where they lived and the type of care needed, still receive it. However, Wait lists increased, particularly in the rural areas where there was no money to be made. The reason I'm talking about this is because we're going to be seeing more and more of this stuff in Overwatch as a result of these cuts, and across gaming in general. Remember, these cuts aren't unique to the Overwatch team, Blizzard, ABK as a whole, or even Microsoft as a whole. Thousands and thousands of people were laid off over 2023, and that trend is likely to continue into 2024. And, as Michelle Ebert says in the PC Gamer article I referenced earlier, before, there were plenty of places to land, and studios would respond to swoop up talent. This time, they're not there, because everyone is drowning, it feels. A major consequence of these layoffs is that they're also hitting a lot of long-time employees of these companies, and that comes with the additional wrinkle of losing institutional knowledge and experience, something that is both a short-term and long-term problem. Short-term, leadership is gone, things will be chaotic, and people will be struggling to relearn the things that their predecessors and former colleagues had to learn through trial and error, instead of being able to learn from experiencing how their predecessors would have handled a given situation and building upon that knowledge. A lot of that knowledge is just going to disappear because nobody's willing to pay to preserve it. Long term, this is going to lead to worse products because again, gaming is a long term industry. The things that people are going to start producing today will be the products were offered in 2027 or later. And even if they've managed to catch up and learn by that point, they'll still have to work around the things that were set in stone during a period of relative inexperience and chaos. Layoffs aren't unique, particularly in the last few years where COVID fucked up everything. But right now, gaming is an industry where layoffs at one company can't be absorbed by other companies, at least not within the industry. Part 3 The Long Term. In the long term, these people disappear. I mean, not literally, at least not for most, some probably will, but figuratively speaking, they become unreachable as part of this industry. The people fired by Blizzard are going to try and find work in other gaming companies, and while some will succeed, given the state of the industry, many won't. Eventually, they'll look for work outside of game development. Those people have been burned, and eventually they'll try and find an industry that's at least less likely to burn them again. This happened in healthcare and education in Alberta. Many of those talented people who were laid off tried to find work in Alberta in their fields of expertise in the public sector. But when that failed, they either found private sector alternatives in the field, found other industries to work in, or, in the worst case scenario, left the province to find work in other less hostile healthcare and education systems. There was a massive exodus of Albertan nurses, doctors, and teachers to BC in particular after it became clear they didn't have a future, at least not a stable one, in Alberta after those Klein cuts. This process is currently repeating itself today as a consequence of the Kenny cuts that exacerbated the damage to our healthcare in a similar way. However, this isn't really the big problem here. Layoffs happen all the time. However, the reason these kinds of layoffs in the gaming industry are different than before is because of what Ebert said before. There aren't places to land. The industry has a sudden glut of talented, experienced, educated people in the field, and you know what that means? Suddenly, game development is a much less attractive field for new professionals. To be clear, this isn't new. Gaming as an industry has always been one that's a bit tough to break into, to put it mildly. It's very hard to get jobs at good companies. It's very hard to keep those jobs. There's a lot of crunch. You really need to get your credits, all of that stuff. However, if you speak to somebody studying game design right now, they're going to tell you their future looks a whole lot more bleak. Most of them, if asked, would probably recommend studying just about anything other than game design right now if you're looking for a career where you might ever actually have some financial stability. This is, again, what happened in Alberta. At one point, education and healthcare looked like smart industries to join if you wanted some financial stability and a good job, so people were more likely to go to school to become a teacher or a nurse. However, after the crash, not only did a lot of the professionals leave the province, new ones weren't showing up to replace them the way they had in the past, which was a problem for a province with a growing population that really, really needed them. People who still got an education in these fields were more likely to look for work in other provinces, meaning that Alberta spent the money on training them but can't benefit from their labor and contributions. In the long term, institutional knowledge is gone. Fresh blood isn't coming up as much as is needed, and on top of that, companies are going to start feeling those long-term consequences right about now from all of it. From cancelled projects, from lower quality output on existing projects, on the delays for ongoing projects thanks to a lack of staff and resources, and more. Again, game development is a slow-moving industry in terms of how long it takes for a change to take effect, so it's not like these companies can fix this problem in the short term either. 
they can't hire back thousands of people and instantly turn out a new game and new DLC and new microtransactions or subscription services. It would take time, and at that point, it's already too late to avoid some damage. Games will have also gotten worse over this period. Years of underfunding and understaffing will mean that gamers will have slowly but surely lost their trust in both the IPs and the studios to do better, and getting them to reinvest their money in new games will be even harder. Games will be released even more unbalanced, content updates will be even less impactful and less optimized, and games will have their release dates either pushed back to try and get it to a workable state, or they'll be met with shit that needed at least another year or two like Cyberpunk 2077. There's also the effect that this stuff will have on consumer habits. Think about how you view microtransactions in Overwatch today versus back in 2016. Buying a loot box or two back then didn't come with the baggage of knowing you're supporting a company that was full of abuse and was laying off employees to make even more money off the absurdly priced cosmetics. Now that you know that, now that you're aware of it, now that that's in your mind, it has a cooling effect on consumer spending that doesn't just disappear, and it'll be harder to turn a profit under those conditions. But hey, we've already discussed one of the easiest ways to fix this. Layoffs! That's right, lay off even more people! Short term, this is going to soften the blow of those long term financial impacts from the past, because reducing expenses is one of the easiest ways to either increase profits or minimize losses. And again, executives will overwhelmingly not be the target of these. It'll just be the workers. The number of employees at the company will have probably crept up bit by bit after those original layoffs, and now they're going to get slammed back down again. Or, hell, maybe the company will just go broke and dissolve. The executives in this situation have been put in an unfavorable position by the executives of the past. While the executives who initiated that first round of massive layoffs were in a position where they didn't have to cut those costs and had ongoing projects to cut that weren't essential to their survival, the executives dealing with the long-term consequences will be facing even more pressure with even fewer outs. They have fewer eggs in fewer baskets and can't afford to drop any of them. However, that doesn't mean they won't, because again, short-term results are what's needed. Executives will make cuts that, barring some sort of miraculous overperformance from a surviving product, will probably put the executives 20 years down the line in an even tighter bind. Conservative governments like Alberta's United Conservative Party government under fascist freak Danielle Smith will continue to cut healthcare and education spending while arguing that worse outcomes are proof that the public system is fundamentally flawed, instead of the actual issue, which is that they have fundamentally sabotaged their ability to succeed because they want to privatize shit to profit their donors and political allies instead of support their constituents. 20 years down the line, if history is anything to go by, Alberta will have yet another conservative government and it will once again be in this position. The problem here is that long-term thinking isn't in the interest of anyone who's currently in charge. Why would Phil Spencer give a shit about whether Overwatch is good in 2044? He barely has an incentive to give a shit about it now. And 2024 is a problem for 20 years down the road. He probably won't even be CEO anymore by that point. Why would Ralph Klein give a shit about whether Albertans get access to good healthcare and good education in 2024 when he initiated his bullshit Alberta Advantage policies in 1994? That'll be a problem for 30 years down the road, and he'll be dead by then anyways. Although, to once again steal a quote from Alberta NDP MLA Marlon Schmidt, the only thing I regret about Ralph Klein's death is that it happened probably 30 years too late. The reason this is a problem is that the decision makers who are doing this long-term harm have no reason to care about it because they won't be able to be held accountable for when that long-term harm eventually manifests. There's no way to get rid of Phil Spencer or Bobby Kotick or any of the other dipshits because, despite how much power our bosses have over us, almost none of us have any democratic power within our workplaces to demand better or vote someone out if they're fucking things up. However, even when it comes to elected officials and elected positions, what consequences could someone reasonably face in Ralph Klein's position? The man resigned as Premier in 2006, resigned as MLA for Calgary Elbow in 2007, and then died in 2013. He can't face a punishment at the ballot box for his decisions anymore, and the current government that carries on his hack and slash legacy can distance themselves from the harms enough that voters feel like they're separate when they really aren't. Americans can single-handedly trace nearly every current failing metric that their country has straight to Ronald Reagan. But what are you going to do about it? People in 1980 weren't voting with 2024 in mind, they were voting with 1980 in mind. Reagan left office in 1989, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 1994, and, by 2000, couldn't remember anyone except his wife, let alone the horrendous damage he'd done as president to the American people. And that's not even to speak about the billions of people around the world who were directly and indirectly negatively affected by his policies who never had any say in whether he got into power in 1980, stayed in power in 1984, or faced consequences for his time in power. He died 20 years ago, and again, the only regret is that it wasn't sooner. That Schmidt quote, I know I use it a lot, was actually originally referencing Margaret Thatcher, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and he said it for the same reason I'm saying it here about Klein and Reagan. She did irreparable harm and there's no way to hold them accountable. All we can do is just wish that we lived in a timeline where they never had the opportunity to do that harm. Long term, video games as an artistic medium, a commercial product, and an industry will suffer thanks to these layoffs. The only way that this trend maybe reverses on its own is an unexpected boom. Games that perform better than expected for studios so the balance sheet doesn't need layoffs to look good, or some sort of brand new unethical monetization model that bleeds fans dry, or some sort of tax breaks that make every studio exec a multi-millionaire.
then again, it's important to remember these studios already are profitable. None of the companies that we're talking about or other companies in the industry that have experienced massive layoffs had fallen to some record low profits in recent years. In fact, most were still pretty comfortably benefiting from the spike in pandemic spending on video games. There was no need for these layoffs to happen in terms of like, if we don't lay people off, the whole company will go under. Executives saw a way to get richer, and shareholders saw a way to get richer, and they're willing to ruin the lives of their workers and the games consumers enjoy to get it. In Alberta, oil prices fell in the 80s, and this was blamed for a lot of the austerity that Klein introduced. But even when oil prices climbed back up, the funding was never fully replaced. Crown corporations were still sold off, and Albertans today are still dealing with the consequences of Klein's attacks on our public services, particularly in rural areas. And again, the real long-term damage here will be in the form of disincentivizing people to work in these professions, to study so they can become part of them. Training to work in education or healthcare or game design takes years, and that's before factoring in that all of these professions are ones where you're constantly learning and improving and expanding your experience. There is no substitute for those people with decades of experience that were wiped out in these layoffs. But on top of that, there are also going to be way fewer people entering the industry in the long term. I mean, if you're in your first year of a game design program, you're probably not going to change it. But the kids who are 10 or 15 years old today, who might have otherwise pursued a career in game development, are going to be advised to pick a different industry by academic advisors, parents, and teachers. And the people who pursue it anyways won't be able to draw upon the knowledge of people with decades of experience when most of those people got laid off before they got there. Public sector jobs like in Alberta's healthcare and education sectors face an additional obstacle of people being brainwashed for decades to see the public sector as bloated, lazy, inefficient, and entitled. That teachers ask for too much money for too little work, that nurses need to get off their asses, that doctors aren't putting in the time, whatever it is. Media production, including game production, faces a similar version of this where any badly produced, badly monetized, or badly upkept game will be blamed on the developers, that they're lazy, unambitious, or uncreative. Look at Mario and Unreal. In both cases, the blame is overwhelmingly placed on the people who are doing their best with not enough resources and too much pressure instead of the people in charge who don't care about you. People trying to decide on a future career can see how we talk about other workers in other industries, and absolutely nobody could be blamed for looking at the level of harassment game developers receive over studio mismanagement and thinking, you know what, maybe I don't want to work 18 hours a day for 8 months straight just to be laid off with no warning and harassed on Twitter, I'll find another career path to follow. It's not a positive outlook, and there isn't a fast and easy solution here. However, that doesn't mean it's entirely hopeless. Part 4. What can be done? The only real advantage that Alberta's healthcare and education workers have had is unionization. The Supreme Court of Canada only affirmed the constitutional right to strike in 2015. Before that, strikes were often risky, and it was not a protected action. Nevertheless, it was a crucial one. In 1995, Klein threatened to privatize laundry services for hospitals. And if you know anything about hospitals, you might understand why it's important for laundry services to be kept in-house, accountable, and well-funded. All 60 workers at the facility immediately facing privatization, many of them immigrant women, went on a wildcat strike without union authorization to protest this privatization. Soon, they were joined by thousands of other protesters at other hospitals. And they won. At least temporarily. Their jobs were still privatized a year and a half later. 25 years later, at the beginning of COVID, Jason Kenney's United Conservative government announced that they planned to fire an insane 11,000 healthcare workers and privatize their positions where they could. This was a record-setting round of layoffs. Thousands once again initiated wildcat strikes, but this time it was unsuccessful. The government forced the layoffs through regardless despite the biggest health crisis in a century crashing down at the province. An advantage of privatization for the government is that the private sector has a lot more room to move in the shadows and mistreat its workers, and cracking public sector unions by privatizing certain sectors within industries is a good way to reduce collective bargaining power. Part of why conservatives like doing it. And it's why unionizing is important. You and your fellow workers need strong unions that can not only protect you in the immediate short term by preventing the worst possible outcome for layoffs, but can also advocate for you and put pressure on regulators, governments, and individual politicians to act in your interests. Your politicians probably don't give a fuck about whether or not you're protected as a worker. They don't give a fuck about you at all unless it affects their power and wealth. And a good union knows how to tighten the screws. They'll never have as much power as the companies in terms of money, but when you stand beside your fellow workers and organize under competent worker-led leadership, you stand your best chance possible of getting the kinds of regulatory protections that prevent companies from doing this. And we know this because anything half-decent that exists as a regulatory protection for workers, like a 40-hour work week, comes from this work, comes from this unionization, standing together with other workers. Other countries don't allow companies to do what Microsoft has done here. There are laws in place, often earned through the blood of union workers of decades past, requiring workers to have decision-making power within their companies, or preventing labor layoffs before cutting executive pay, or banning practices like stock buybacks that allow companies to profit like fucking crazy off of all this short-sighted bullshit. At the beginning I said this video was only for the people who care about whether or not their games are still good, and I want to reiterate, this is how you get good games. Financial stability is one of the biggest factors in your ability to function at optimal levels, and game designers are going to either perform worse thanks to financial uncertainty in a volatile industry or refuse to become part of that industry altogether in the long run because they don't have that here. 
the best games are the games made by people whose bills are paid, whose families are healthy, and whose futures look stable. These people entered this industry because they love video games and they want to make the best ones possible. The obstacles in the way of that are overwhelmingly the executives and market forces that insist on publishing whatever shit makes the most money and then laying off everyone anyways. Giving the power to the workers, protecting their right to demand better, and fighting to prioritize games and the people who make them over the executives who want to buy another yacht is how we get there. And even if you're not in the games industry, join a union. That's still, to a pretty large extent, frankly, a decision you can justify selfishly. You'll make more money in a union, you'll get better benefits in a union, you'll be more protected from bullshit layoffs in a union, and you'll be strengthening the overall power of unions because unions support one another. Unions like the Teamsters regularly show up on picket lines of other unions and throw their weight behind them to fight for their cause. Why? Because they understand that, as workers, we're all fundamentally on the same side here. While divided we beg, united we can demand. This is why corporations don't like unions. It's why conservative governments don't like unions, because they don't like dealing with workers who can stand together and fight against them. If you want to be selfish, join a union so you can make more money to buy more video games and so that your union can work with other unions to fight for better video games. Layoffs like this don't have to happen, and the short, medium, and long-term impacts of these layoffs don't have to play out this way. Strong unions can fight for regulatory changes to prevent this from happening again, and at a bare minimum can guarantee the best possible severance packages for affected workers in the future. There is a reason why companies hate unions and love layoffs. It's because the executives at the top know that a union fights for its workers and demands better for them, instead of just throwing billions of dollars at executives and shareholders who contributed nothing and deserve nothing. The fight for unions in gaming has been a hard one, but it's one that needs to succeed if we're going to have even a shot of breaking the cycle. Unions can't outright ban all layoffs like on a legal level, they can't write that legislation. But they can do everything in their power to fight to protect the workers and put their interests, namely their interest in being treated well, making cool video games, and getting paid fairly for them, ahead of enriching Bobby Kodak and protecting assholes like him from consequences above everyone else's well-being. In other words, support the workers, put the blame on the executives looking for short-term turnaround at the expense of the long-term fate of the medium and the people who built it. And remember this when Overwatch starts slipping. Not that it's going to take that long, apparently, given that they accidentally uploaded a trailer for the new season with an audio watermark for the music licensing company that they forgot to license the music from. It's wild. I don't know how that got through. Your fellow workers who are still at Blizzard aren't the bad guys, nor are the ones who got laid off. Standing with them against this bullshit system is the only chance we have of changing it. Or, if you don't care about that, it's also the only chance we have of Overwatch still being remotely playable in the not-so-distant future. Beyond Overwatch, though, remember that none of us are immune to these forces. In the private sector, there's always an owner who stands to make money by screwing you over, and will do it if it can. And, in the public sector, there's always a conservative politician who stands to earn votes from the people who believe the public sector doesn't deserve the protections that they can't get in the private sector. Your bosses and those politicians are part of the same Leopards Eating People's Faces party. And beyond just not voting for the Leopards Eating People's Faces party under the mistaken belief they'd never eat your face, you also need to work together with the other people with faces who do not want them eaten. The people in charge do not care about whether or not you can put food on the table, pay the electricity, able to illuminate that table or pay rent on a home to put that table in. But that doesn't mean nobody does. Your colleagues, co-workers, peers, and other members of the working class can come together to care for, support, and protect one another. And you can do the same for them. Ultimately, layoffs like these aren't inevitable. In the short, medium, and long term, they're bad for everyone, and for the products. And yet, they'll keep happening because people in power profit from them happening for just long enough to cash out if nobody stops them. Politicians and executives won't voluntarily do it. Instead, you can do it. You can take action to make sure that these short, medium, and long-term impacts don't happen the way that they have here, and the way that they will continue happening without action. This might sound like I'm being a bit of a doomer, but I promise this is an optimistic message. Workers have proven in the past and in the present that they can make change happen when they stand together. And if we want our games to be good, we need to help them do that. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And remember, the YouTube algorithm can't tell the difference between a comment saying how much you love the video and a comment calling it communist propaganda, so go nuts. If you're a channel member, voting open today for the March Members' Choice poll between these five topics. And if you're not a member, you can become one by clicking the Join button below for $5 a month to vote. To give you the quick elevator pitch for each one, Who's Writing Overwatch's History first appeared in the November poll, and would be about who gets to write the history textbooks in the Overwatch universe, and why it matters when it comes to telling the game's story. Drag Queen's VTubers and Jester's Privilege first appeared in December, and would focus on how performing through the facade of a character allows an entertainer unique privileges that they otherwise wouldn't be able to access. What Overwatch tells you to care about and why it's a problem appeared in both November and January, taking third both times, and would be about how Overwatch's leaderboard causes players to view certain stats as the most important, and how that messes with their understanding of individual performances as well as the game as a whole. Just Say Magic Exists in Overwatch is the runner-up from both January and February focus on why, or if, Overwatch just starts saying that magic exists. 
Lastly, Blizzard's Panopticon isn't working is a new topic for the March poll and would focus on why the style of moderation used for Overwatch fails to actually moderate player behavior. Like I said, if you'd like to vote in this poll, memberships are $5 a month and can be purchased through the join button below. Also, today marks the beginning of a study that I'm running for a future video. If you haven't already signed up, unfortunately the sign up window is now closed. Also, I need to make one important clarification. While the sign up survey did allow respondents to respond that they were under 18, those respondents will not actually be eligible to participate. If you are one of those people, I apologize for not informing you in advance, but as someone who was also once a teenager, I know that being told this is an 18 plus thing without being required to verify it just leads to people putting in inaccurate age data to get through, and that could risk tainting the results. If you are part of that group, you'll get an email informing you you're ineligible but thanking you for your willingness to participate, and you are welcome to participate in future studies once you hit 18. Everyone else should have gotten their first survey today. Please fill it out ASAP so I can get to work processing everyone's data, and make sure to respond to future surveys ASAP as well. More details are provided to you in the emails you have received and will receive throughout the duration of the study. What this study is going to mean for anyone who's not participating in it for the channel is that I'll be taking a bit of a break next week. There's likely going to be no streams or videos or anything like that because I'm going to be basically going full time on the study. You know, it's going to be 10, 12 hours a day every day for the next week or two. Like I have maybe slightly bitten off more than I can chew. Lastly, I want to give a big thank you to all my channel members. Mini Q, Olesp, Cage the Orc, Fish Toast, Alex Stone, Name of the Survivor, Destiny, Connor, Yoshi of the Wire, It's Peggy BTW, Cat Lover 192, Sourdough, Illuma Riley, Venus, Monkey 12 Ninja, Cadence, Windex the Great, V, The Leathers, and Marsh Alice. Whether you're a channel member, a subscriber, or you just clicked on this out of curiosity, thank you very much for watching, and I hope I'll see you around again soon.